Good morning. Thank God for this morning. It's a beautiful Sunday morning. It's bright outside. And thank God that we are um, in this series also, Encounters with Jesus. I just realized how rich is the stories in the Bible regarding how these ordinary people met the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, I hope that in this series you will continue to learn many principles from the Word of God. Although these stories are very familiar, I know. Most of these stories you know already. Don't close your mind, don't close your hearts, because I think there are lots of things that the Lord has in, in store for us in these particular stories. Okay, uh, encounters with Jesus. Jesus met these individuals in their specific, unique ways. Uh, this morning, we are going to learn uh, another story in, in um, John chapter 4. The title of our message this morning is about the Westing Well. How many of you went to us, you see, a tourist spot and there was a wishing well, and you dropped coins there. Why, why did you drop coins there? Just because you saw people dropping coins there, so you dropped coins there. Uh, what is the story behind the wishing well? Uh, so I didn't know, so I went into the encyclopedia, Wikipedia, in our Google. <laughs> and it is said there that it's from the European folklore that these are, these are wells that you can audibly and verbalize your wish, and your wish will be granted. And uh, it's because there are superstitious beliefs that in the water are deities, or the gods has provided these deities that can answer your request or your desires. So when you throw your coins into the wishing well, it depends also with his head, you know, or tail. I mean, if it's, it, 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 it reaches into the bottom with the heads up, your wish, wish will be granted. But how many of you had dropped coins into the wishing well and then your wish will be granted? And in the little portion of that article, I saw, um, I saw this line also that in 2006, that is um, almost 10 years ago, there is this wishing well called Fountain Money, uh, Fountain Money Mountain. In one year, the amount of coins is just under three million pounds sterling for one year. So you can just imagine how many tourists will drop coins into this well. That it's almost three million pounds of sterling coins drop every year. So it's, I think uh, the owner of the well is becoming richer because of this. Well, our story is about the well. It's about an old well that became a wishing well for a lady who was hopeless, who was desperate. This is a story about Jesus and the Samaritan woman. And we can find this in John chapter 4, verse 142. We will not be reading the whole chapter because it's, so, it's too long, but I will just read uh, some portions of these verses, which is very important for us to know and understand this story. This is a story where we are introduced where Jesus left Judea, departed again for Galilee. He had to pass through Samaria, so he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. So we know the setting here, how the encounter happened. It was when Jesus left Jerusalem, and he was moving north, and he has to pass Samaria. And the, the verse 3 tells us that he must pass Samaria. He had to. Well, it was the direct road, but for the Jews, it was not the appropriate road. They have to detour somewhere, you know. They have to go and cross the Jordan River and go along the banks and went, have to go up into Galilee. Although it's a, a longer road, that's not appropriate for the Jews. And Jesus passed by this well, and he sat down there alone. He was weary. In the sixth hour, 
sixth hour is 12 o'clock noon because the, the time of the Jews, they started counting their time from six o'clock in the morning until that six o'clock in the next morning. That's how they count their time. So it's the 12 hour or the 12 o'clock noon. So it was very hot. So a well will be like this. It's a, you know, you, you, you know what I mean by well. There is a bucket and it's paved. It is protected that no children can jump into that. And we see here that the woman realized that this guy can give, him, him, give her something. So in verse 15, he said to Jesus here, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have come here to draw water. Now, this is a desire of the woman. She just expressed this to Jesus. She did not know Jesus yet. She did not know who is this person yet. But Jesus offered to her living water, and she said, Lord, uh, sir, give me this water. It became a wishing well to her, to her. And somehow, I know that all of us have desires. All of us had you know, something that we want and something that we need, and we don't know where we can get it. But Jesus is, is the source of every, um, every need that he had in our lives. He can give it to us because he promised to us abundant life. Well, before Jesus can give her the living water, Jesus had to expose two things in her life. Number one is that her fatigue. Number two is her falsehood, and Jesus can give her her freedom. This woman was fatigued. How do, how do we know? In verse 15, her reason to ask for this water from Jesus is that, so that I will not be thirsty or to, have, to come here to draw water again. She was exhausted. She was weary. She was fatigued, not only physically, but Jesus pointed out to her that she was fatigued also emotionally and spiritually. Well, she expressed her in this verse that she was fatigued physically. I don't need to come here every noon or every day to draw water. How many of you grew up in the rural areas where there are no tap water, there are no pipes, you know, connecting to your house? I grew up with that. I have to go downhill into our spring and to carry water every day when I was in elementary, in high school. We got only a tap water when I was in the university, I was in college. It's not easy. And you see, my experience is that we have to carry water. Everybody carries water during our time. So it's just fun for us. We grew up going together into the, into the, into the spring. And we, we carry with us with long poles or bamboos. We have to break the nodes so that we can put the water there and carry it on our shoulder. And one time, when I reached home, it was so slippery, I slipped it my, my, my hands, and then the, the bamboo fell into the, the stone and all the water were gone. <laughs> it was so frustrating. She was so tired of carrying water every day from this well. Where I heard a message from this that the well of Jacob, this well, is 150 feet long, I mean deep. 150 feet deep is equivalent to 25 meters. So it's not easy to pull the bucket that, that deep. So she must be very weary physically. And not only that, but Jesus pointed to her that you are also weary spiritually. But how did Jesus surface this? There are two things. Jesus first asked her a drink before he offered her a drink. In verse 7, a woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Here comes Jesus. According to chapter 1, verse 2, he is the creator of the world. Not anything in this world is not created by Jesus. Here comes Jesus who requested this woman a drink. He is... Helpless. It seems that he was, he was weary, he was tired, he sat there alone, and he asked this woman, give me a drink. What does it mean? First is that it means that he was thirsty, he was human. I realize and I believe that 
the best gift that God has given to us is the humanity of Jesus. If not one of the best gifts that God has given to you and to me. The humanity of Jesus. Because Jesus was human, He became tired. He became exhausted. He became thirsty. He was hungry. He cried. Jesus wept. His humanity is the gift to us because He can identify your need and my need. According to the author of Hebrews, He was tempted in all points in His life, yet He did not commit sin because He was a sinless man. That's why He can identify with your need and my need. Whatever is your need right now, whatever is the pain, suffering, whatever, Jesus had identified with that and can identify with that. Not only that, He started a conversation to engage this woman, to connect with this woman. He wants to minister to this woman. Why is it that He must need to go to Samaria? And why is it that He is going to go into this well and sat there and wait for this woman. Why? Because the purpose is to meet this woman. He wants to encounter this woman in a personal way. God is a God who is looking for somebody who is in need because he's going to meet her. Even for the Son of Man, the Bible tells us, he came to serve and to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many. He came in order that he will be a blessing to each one of us. His purpose is to minister. His purpose is to be a blessing, to give his life. And this woman needs needs him as much as we need also the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe that thirdly, it's because he wants to honor this woman also. This woman is a Samaritan, and she is a woman. She drew water in the middle of noon. I mean, it was high noon which is very unusual to draw water because it's very hot. Why? Maybe because this woman has been hiding something in her heart. She was ashamed and embarrassed to face people. She is antisocial here. When in fact, she withdrew to Je- from Jesus here. But Jesus honored her by giving her the importance that you can bless me, you can give me something. Is it not? Is it not when you, when you are needed by somebody, you feel important because you are needed? Give me a drink. The Son of God, the creator of the universe, asked her, give me a drink. Can Jesus just go and put the bucket inside and get water by herself? Maybe he can do that. But he said, give me a drink because he wanted to let the woman know that he is, she is very important to Jesus. What was her reply in verse 8? Oh, no, his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. This is very unusual also. Jesus requested everybody to live, to buy food. Was it really very heavy to carry the food that everybody has to live? But just because maybe this woman has to be ministered privately with Jesus. Maybe in our Singapore parlance, he cannot, she cannot tahan if there are so many people there. But because it was only Jesus, only one guy there, she can go into this well and draw water. In verse 9, the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. This is the reason why. She must be very emotionally and spiritually exhausted. Why? She said, How can that be? How is it? You, a Jew, I'm a woman, I'm a Samaritan, You Jew has no dealing with us. She knew that no Jew can talk to a woman, a Samaritan like her. She just said a reality about how a Jew and a Samaritan relates with each other. Now listen carefully. Jesus gave us an example that we should not look unto people and draw a line because of race. Samaritans are half Jew and half Gentiles. The story of the Samaritans is that during the division of the kingdom of Israel, after Solomon, the whole nation was divided into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom was captured by the Assyrians. And the Assyrians dominated that portion in, Assyria, in, in, in Samaria, and then some of their 
people went there and to intermarriage with the Jews, and that's why the Samaritans came into the picture. They are not pure Jews. They are mestizos and mestizas. That's why the pure Jews despise them, that they are not Jews at all. That's why they, have, they are considered as not belonging to the Jewish race. And the, the lady recognized that you are a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. We are of different race. Let's not make the issue of race. Because Jesus did not put a, a line between, you know, a Jew and a Samaritan or a Filipino or a Chinese or whatever. Jesus wants to reach out to every soul in this world. It's, every soul is very precious in the eyes of the Lord, in the heart of Jesus. Well, this is the map of Palestine during the time of Jesus. The blue line there is the direct road, and Sychar is there. And uh, <clears throat> the red, the red um, line should be the proper road for the Jews. They have to escape passing through Samaria because of their prejudice to the Samaritans. But Jesus did not allow this argument. Because let, let us learn also here that Jesus did not argue with the lady. Whenever we are going to share the gospel, there is no point of arguing. There is no point of making our point and making ourselves right before the person. Our purpose is to win the heart of the person, not to win an argument. Jesus was so tender in just pursuing the heart of this lady. In verse 10, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, this lady did not know the gift of God. How many people today are like this Samaritan woman? Because they don't know the gift of God. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. Jesus is a gift. And how many people in this world don't know that God has given us a gift? Jesus said to her, you don't know the gift of God. And you don't know who is talking to you. If you have known, you should have said, give me a drink. Uh, you would have asked him, living water. And the woman contain, continued to hear tired. Uh, you see, in Revelation 22, verse 17, let us see here the cross-reference of, even in the last book of the Bible, the Lord still offered this living water. The Spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. It's free. It's a gift. So this woman did not understand what Jesus was talking about. Maybe she was thinking that it was a physical water, but Jesus wanted to pursue her heart, pursue her soul, her spirit. That's why in verse 11, the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. So this woman remembered the goodness of his father, Jacob. He saw this well. This well was many hundred years old already. During the time of the patriarch, Jacob left it to her sons, or his sons. And up to this time, all the descendants of Jacob was able to use this well. I think Jacob did just what he can as a father. Well, every father, like me, we should leave something that our children's children will be able to use in the future. Like Jacob's, he, he died many years ago. He's already gone, but the well is there. And this well became a platform where the gospel will be preached to this lady. I believe that Jacob did what was right to leave an inheritance of the well that the descendants can use. But there is a descendant of Jacob under the line of Joseph and under the, under the, the promise of, of God that there will be a Messiah that will not only give water out of this well, but he can give living water. And this woman said, are you greater than our father Jacob? Yes, he is much greater, much, much greater than Jacob. Well, how much can we really uh, give?
to our children, the security of our children, maybe not much like Jacob. We can live in inheritance, physical inheritance, maybe phys water, maybe it's like the material things that we, you know, in, gave to our children. That's much. That's, that's enough. But can it really satisfy our children, our descendants? Can it satisfy their hearts? This lady recognized the help of their father, great father Jacob, but she was in need of something in her heart that this water cannot satisfy her. So which well are you drawing this water? Are you drawing water from, quote unquote, the Jacob's well in this world? The Jacob's well that have been descended from your parents? Or have you drawn this water from the fountain, from the living fountain where the living water comes from, from Jesus? Many people today thought that they can be satisfied by the physical things in this world. Oh, if I can have this job and I can be promoted, if I get this project, if I have this property, I will be happy, I will be joyful, I will be satisfied. This woman drew water day by day in this well, but she recognized that there is something in me that cannot be satisfied by this water. And Jesus came into the picture to give her the living water. Let's remember this, that there is no other source of living water, there is no other source that can satisfy your soul apart from what the Lord Jesus Christ promised. The Jews failed to recognize this. They forgot that God is the source of true satisfaction in life. And how Jeremiah described them is very sad. Jeremiah 2 verse 13, For my people, the Jews, have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. What a sad story about the Jews that they left Jehovah, they left the living God because they, they, they went to the broken cistern that can hold no water. Even Peter said, false teachers are just like empty wells that you cannot draw water from it. There's only one source of living water and it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 12 and verse 13, Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. You go to the Jacob's well in this world, you will be thirsty again. And this woman was just a picture of that person. But Jesus said, whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. He repeated this in John chapter 7. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So Jesus promised him that I can give you this living water, and this water can satisfy you. Jesus did not mean about the physical water meant about what can satisfy his, her soul and her spirit. And the woman, <clears throat> the woman answered her, him, Sir, give me this water. Jesus offered her the living water. Jesus unearthed in her that she is a fatigued woman. She is fatigued physically, emotionally, and spiritually. But she was not honest yet this time. This time that she said, I want this water, sir. Now, there was another problem. That was her falsehood. She was not only fatigued, but she was also living in falsehood. Jesus said in verse 16, Go, call your husband and come here. It seems a disconnect. Before I can give you the living water, call your husband first. What was the answer of the woman? The woman said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you, have, what you said is true. She concealed her 
her identity and her relationship here. She concealed it to Jesus, but Jesus have an, can see everyone. Nothing is hidden to Jesus. He knew every heart. And Jesus had to unearth her falsehood. Go call your husband. Now listen carefully. The gospel or the living water, the promise of eternal life, cannot be given to anybody unless our problem of sin, our, our uh, realities of sin will not be dealt with. There should be repentance from sin, folks. There is no, Jesus did not advocate here an easy believism. Oh, give me that water. I can give you. No. Before I can give you the water, you have to repent of your sins first. You have to recognize your sins first. But this woman tried to hide it and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said, yeah, you're right. The answer of the woman is very classic. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. You're a prophet. Sir, you're a prophet. And he, she changed again the topic. She said in verse 20, Our fathers worship on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Now, she mentioned here a religion again. You Jews worship in Jerusalem. We worship in Mount Gerizim. I'm a religious person. I think I, I can go to this place and worship my God. It doesn't matter how I live. As long as I worship in this place, you Jews, I think... There are many people who are like this. You see, you worship Jesus, we worship this God, it doesn't matter. All roads go to heaven. No, not all roads go to heaven. As they said, all roads go to Rome. That's not true to heaven. There's only one way, folks. There's only one way. Jesus is the only way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can go to the Father except through Him. There's only one mediator given to, by God to us that we will be breathed and we will be connected Again with God, reconciled with God is the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. So this woman tried to argue in her religion. He, she argued about her race. You are a, you are a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. You are from Jerusalem or from, from, um, from, from your place, uh, the Jews. I, I'm, I'm a, from Samaria. She argued about religion. You have your own religion. I have my own religion. But Jesus said, let me just emphasize here also, Proverbs 28, verse 13, whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. That was what Jesus wants her to realize. You cannot solve your sin by covering it, by concealing it, by putting it under the cover. Under the rug. I hope that it cut across in your heart that if you are here this morning, there's no other way to solve your, your problem of sin without confessing it before the Lord, recognizing that you are, you are sinful before the Lord and you need His forgiveness. You need the cleansing from His blood. There's no other way for that. You cannot cover your sin by anything, by good works, by good things. We call this religious compensation. What do you mean by religious compensation? Oh, I can do wicked things because I give money to the church. Oh, I can do this wicked thing because I donate money to this um, organization, religious organization. I think I have put money so much that the weight of my good works is like this, and the wicked things only like this. It is as if that we are weighing the balance Good and bad, good and bad, but that's not the way how God looks at you. The Bible tells us that if we do the Ten Commandments and offend in one point of all, we are guilty of all. Heaven is a perfect place, folks, and you cannot go to heaven with a 0.0001% of sin. You must be perfect, and you cannot be perfect. Only God is perfect. Only Jesus is perfect. That's why His sacrifice on the cross is the perfect Sacrifice. It is finished. It is done completely. You can rest on that. You can depend on that. You do not need to do good works in order to cover your sinfulness. You just need to acknowledge your sinfulness before the Lord Jesus Christ and He can forgive you. May it be that we will learn from this. The woman tried to conceal her sinfulness by her religion, 
by her, you know, by her uh, hiding her private life. But look at how, how Jesus uh, answered, to, answered her, gave her a free freedom. In verse 21, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. Now Jesus directly now had confronted the woman, believe me. You don't know what you are worshiping. We, the Jews, know what we are worshiping, for salvation is from the Jews. The time will come that you are not going to go to this place to worship. I'm not going to this place for God is everywhere. God is a spirit, and you have to worship Him in spirit and in truth. You do not need to live a lie. Why? Because Jesus has emphasized here a relationship with God, and a relationship with God is not confined with a place. You do not come here in Gospel Light Christian Church building in order to have God here because God is not in your home. No. Christianity and having a relationship with God is not confined in a place. God is a spirit. And you need to be related to that spirit. You need to be related with Him truthfully in your heart. The time will come, woman, that that will happen. How did the woman answer? I know that the Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Now you see here in this statement from the woman that he has a deep desire and a hope that the Messiah will come. Although how she lived, she lived um, a life which might be embarrassing to people, to the society, but there was a thug in her heart. There was a desire in her heart that the Messiah will be coming. I'm hoping that she will come. Because he will, he will tell us everything. And Jesus revealed himself. I who speak to you am he. I am the Messiah. What happened after here? The disciples arrived, but the woman left. So the woman left the, her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come and see. A man who told me all that I ever did, can this be the Christ? It's interesting to note that he went, she went to the, to, to the well to fetch water, but he, she forgot as she left her jar there purposely. And she went to the town. What was your news to the people in the town? She said, come. Here is a man who told everything of who am I, what I did, everything I did. In verse 39, many Samaritans from the town of Sychar believe in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. Well, there was no sinner's prayer. There was no kneeling down, closing eyes, and prayer by the woman to receive Jesus into her heart as her Savior. But we know that this woman was freed from her sins because of the effect in her heart, because of the effect of her lives. I think the jar was a symbol of her old life. I think the jar was a symbol of her fatigue, weariness. She, lived, she left it there because her heart was already full and bubbling with joy because of her newfound faith in Christ. She went to the city of Sychar, to the town of Sychar, telling people of everything that she did. She was now honest before people. She did not hide anymore to people. She was open to people now. What happened to her heart? I think there was a change in her heart. Uh, four years ago, when I heard the testimony, when I heard that Mani Pacquiao became a born-again believer, I was really skeptical. I was really very skeptical. I didn't believe it because I said, see, he is a very famous guy. Um, his, his fame, his, uh, you know, his lifestyle also. He, he owns uh, a lot of uh, 
maybe businesses or he has partnerships with gamblers all days like that. He was a womanizer like that. So it cannot be true, I said. So I went to the YouTube and I went to some channels that I can hear his testimony. And even just this year, he was interviewed in California before the fight with Floyd Mayweather in the church. And this was what he said. He said, there was a problem in our family because the fame goes to my head, Pacquiao admitted. I know how to gamble. I know how to drink. A lot of girls womanizing like that. Pacquiao, though, said that he's changed man far from the person he once was. This was quoted from the uh, GMA net, uh, network uh, clippings. What I be, when I heard that he admitted in public, in TV, before people that I'm a womanizer, I'm a gambler, I'm a sinner, then I said, he must be true. You cannot just spread your dirty linens in public if you're not true. What I'm saying is that if you say that you are a changed man, if you say that you love the Lord Jesus Christ and you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and Jesus is in you and you are a changed man, nobody can argue with you. If you talk about dinosaurs, if you talk about galaxies, you know, many can argue with you, right? Does dinosaur exist? Are there people in Mars? Many can argue with you, but if you say to people, I believe in Jesus one day, many years ago, and this was what happened. I, I have a newfound love to my family. I have a newfound love to people. I want to serve people. Before, I cannot apologize to people. I cannot say sorry to somebody. I was very tough, very proud. But God has changed my heart. I tell you, I don't know why, but it happened when I trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. This woman was changed when he met the Lord Jesus Christ. When she met the Lord Jesus Christ. And you too can have this experience if you have a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't need to be exhausted in this world, you, to be weary in this world, to experience all the pains of the pressures of catching all the five seas in Singapore or whatever. It cannot satisfy your soul. Only Jesus can. He is the one who promised you living water. And he promised that out of your belly will flow living wells of living water. There is freedom from fatigue and falsehood through the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray.